the minor prophets for beginners, uh, majoring in minors. This is the lesson number six. We're going to do Jonah, the fifth, Jonah, the fifth of the minor uh, prophets. And this is part one. Uh, Jonah is the last of the six uh, minor prophets whose ministry occurred before the destruction of the Northern Kingdom of Israel and that took place in 721 BC. So we have Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah. Uh, they're the other five prophets of that period. Jonah's book is very different in style in that the other prophets' writings were mostly made up of oracles. Oracles, warnings, prophecies of coming judgment or future blessings. Jonah's book, on the other hand, is mainly a narrative of the events that took place in his life at a certain time. It's a story. You know, he was here, he went there, this happened, that happened, so on and so forth. You know, uh, unlike the other uh, five prophets of his uh, time uh, period. For this reason, uh, we're going to take a different approach in studying his book. We'll do it in two lessons. Lesson one will be a review of uh, the book itself, the story itself. And then lesson two will be various lessons and applications we can draw from his experience. I believe one of the most used stories and books used for vacation Bible school is the book of Jonah. Boy, if we didn't have the book of Jonah, I mean, half, half the VBSs in the world would not, <laughs> would not uh, take place. I think this is so because the idea of someone being swallowed by a great fish and living in the belly of that fish for three days captures the imagination of young people at every age. Jonah, of course, was a real person not a fable, not a, you know, a, imagine, a story of imagination, but he was a real person, uh, not an Old Testament uh, parable. He was a historical figure and his name means dove, uh, means dove. And uh, in Jonah 1 verse uh, 1 says that he was the son of Amittai. And uh, this same Jonah, son of Amittai is also mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 to 27. So you have internal evidence referring to Jonah as a true historical uh, figure. 2 Kings tells us that he was a prophet in the Northern Kingdom of Jeroboam II, who lived in the eighth century before Christ. But it is the book of Jonah that describes an important event in his life, which revealed both a great gift that he had, as well as several weaknesses in his life, the good and the bad uh, of Jonah. So let's open our Bibles and study both facets of this man's life to see if we can learn something about ourselves uh, by reading about uh, his life. And I'm going to read, no use to, I'm not going to paraphrase the story. We're just going to read the story. You know, it, it, it explains everything a lot better than I do. So we're going to begin right there in Jonah chapter one. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, how is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? 
What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and from what people are you? He said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So I want you to note that the story explains itself, but within the story, we discover a man who had a great gift, the gift of prophecy. Now the gift of prophecy expressed itself in several ways. In the book of Jonah demonstrates that Jonah possessed the gift in all of its forms. For example, there is prophecy in the form of powerful preaching. In verse two, we are told that God sends him to use his gift, his ability at a certain place and for a specific purpose. The gift is assumed. He knows that he has it. He merely receives instruction on where to use it. It's not like God said to him, you, you, I'm going to give you the gift of prophecy and you're going to go here and there. He already knew that he had this gift. He was simply receiving instructions on how to use it and where to go, uh, where to go use it. Um, but of course we read in verse 10 that Jonah refuses to do God's will. But despite this, we get a glimpse of his ability as he shares his faith with the men on board the ship. Now these uh, were pagans ready to worship anything, to do anything to get out of trouble. But the word said that they actually believed Jonah simply through hearing him speak to them. Not only did they believe him, they were ready to follow his instructions. His ability was evident even when it wasn't used in context. Even when Jonah disobeyed God, he couldn't hide the fact that he was a powerful preacher. Another uh, aspect of the gift of prophecy is precise prediction. That's another facet of that gift. Another facet of the gift, as I said, a prophecy in these times was the ability to accurately predict the future. Today, anybody with a website can set themselves up as a psychic or a fortune teller. People applaud them if a modern day prophet is right, maybe two out of three or four times. But in the Old Testament, the true gift of prophecy was confirmed if all the predictions were 100% complete and true. Any margin of error resulted in death. So not many people kind of uh, you know, acknowledged being a prophet because they knew if uh, they made a prediction and it didn't come true, uh, they'd be killed. So we keep reading in verse 11. So they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its uh, raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. How amazing is this? You see the power of Jonah. We see that despite the terrible circumstances and consequences to Jonah, his prediction about the solution to the problem was accurate. The writer describes the attitude and the actions of the survivors on the ship. In their worship and charge, the confirmation of his gift is recognized by these pagans. In other words, they see the sign that he said, throw me into the, you know, throw me into the waters and the, the storm will stop. And sure enough, when they did that, the storm stopped. They then worship the God that had been preached to them. They had all their own gods, but now they're, they're worshiping the God of Jonah. And then at the end, they offer true repentance as a sign of their sincere faith. 
all based on the preaching of Jonah who was being disobedient to God in his, uh, you know, in his fleeing away from his responsibility. So even in disobedience, the word of the Lord does not return void. And then a third aspect of uh, the prophetic gift is poetic prayer. And that is seen in chapter two. We begin reading uh, in verse 17. It says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped uh, around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life uh, from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your uh, holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry uh, land. And so we see that Jonah expresses his plight and also its solution. He's in an impossible situation. He's buried alive, he says, in the, in the depths of Sheol. His only recourse is to cry out to God because in his present physical condition, God is truly the only person, the only being that can hear him is God. He looks at his surroundings and he compares them to the times that he worshiped the Lord in Jerusalem at the temple and, and how sweet it was. He has no offering of animals or money to make, uh, but he realizes that he can offer other things that are more precious, even though he's in the belly of a fish. He can offer praise. He can offer thanksgiving. He can offer his faith that God can save him. He can offer repentance and a promise of obedience. And so uh, from inside the belly of the fish, he realizes not only that God will hear him, but also that what God wants from man is always inside of man and doesn't require a fancy building or a ceremony in order to give to God. Once he realizes this, once he responds to this, he is released from the fish, a changed person ready to use his gift. Now, the amazing thing here is not only that Jonah learned these things, but that he expressed them so eloquently in these few verses. You see, one aspect of prophecy is the ability to express in beautiful language the mind and the will of God. One will not find more beautiful poetry and powerful images in the Bible than are contained here in Jonah's prayer. And so in the first two chapters, we're introduced to a man who possesses the gift of prophecy in all of its many expressions. In other words, he is able to preach in a powerful manner. As a prophet, he's also able to make precise predictions, and we see here uh, also uh, formulate a beautiful poetic prayer unto God. And so we move on to chapter number three, and in chapter number three, we see how this gift was used in context and how effective Jonah was in his role as a preacher. So we begin in chapter three, and it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, 
go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk, meaning it took three days to walk from one end of the city to the other end of the city. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes. He issued a proclamation and it said, in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Again, the chapter itself is self-explanatory. Jonah goes to Nineveh and he warns them to repent or else they will be destroyed. The writer describes the complete change of heart from the king all the way on down. As a result of Jonah's preaching and their response to it, God spares the city. And notice at the beginning, uh, he says that the city of Nineveh was a great city. Three days, in other words, it would take three days of walking to go from one end of the city to the other end of the city. But it says that Jonah on the first day uh, began to preach. And on the first day, the people began to repent. In other words, he didn't have to walk three days across the city. Right away at the very beginning, on the very first day of his preaching, uh, it, it hit a nerve. And the people, including the king, uh, began to repent, uh, a testimony to the power of uh, Jonah's uh, preaching. Well, uh, the story uh, would have ended here, and, and uh, it could have ended here rather, and, and we'd have a marvelous story with a good lesson about repentance and God's love and everything all neat and clean and tied up in a bow. But there's another chapter that goes on to describe Jonah's faults. Uh, so far, what we've seen are Jonah's powers, his abilities as a prophet. The last chapter talks about his faults. So we begin uh, reading uh, in chapter four. It says, but it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, please Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all of his soul to die saying, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? 
And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? Well, at first we see that Jonah runs away from God and we could conclude that he was just afraid. And after the fish experience, he gained courage, but this would be inaccurate, it wouldn't be true. Jonah was not afraid. We know this for several reasons. First, he didn't deny his faith in front of the pagans who were hostile to him. He, he told them exactly who he was. Uh, he offered himself to be thrown overboard. There's a guy who's got courage. Go ahead, just kill me, you know, get rid of me and that'll save your ship. He didn't panic when the, when the fish swallowed him. Uh, and then he went to Nineveh and preached against it after all, a traditional enemy of the Jews. And that's the idea. Uh, Nineveh, Syria, uh, they were a traditional enemy of the Jews. As they grew in power, they grew as a threat uh, to the uh, northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom as well. Jonah's faults are made evident after he's finished preaching. What are the faults we see in him? Well, first of all, he was prejudiced. He was prejudiced. Some think that anger or impulsiveness were his problems but the anger was the result of the true problem, prejudice. He was upset because God spared Jonah's non-Jewish enemies. These Assyrians, these pagans, they were a thorn in the side of the Jewish nation. And here was a chance to wipe them out. And what does God do? He saves them. He gives them an opportunity to be saved. He explains that he ran away because he knew that God would forgive them if they repented and he didn't want to be the one who offered them the chance to repent. He wanted them destroyed. As far as he was concerned, they could and should die in their sins. He was prejudiced and even God's acceptance of these people couldn't force Jonah to accept them any more than he had before. So one of his problem was prejudice against this nation. Another one, he was presumptuous. He was presumptuous. He assumed that he knew better than God. Now that they were spared, there would be no chance of defeating them militarily. They might have to actually deal with them as brothers. Of course, history shows that the Assyrians eventually lost, the, uh, you know, lost their uh, fervency uh, for their repentance and uh, attacked the Northern Kingdom and the Northern Kingdom uh, lost the war. Uh, and Nineveh eventually was destroyed as their repentance and safety died away later on. And Jonah wanted to dictate to God what God should do with his life and the life of uh, his nation. And uh, so uh, he was presumptuous. He, he, he felt he knew better than God. If God would just uh, uh, destroy them, well then, you know, where he lived in the Northern Kingdom, we could just survive and just keep right on going. Instead, by saving them, it put the Northern Kingdom in uh, danger. And once the, uh, the Ninevites uh, fell back into their old pagan ways, well, then they rose up and eventually attacked and destroyed the Northern Kingdom. This, of course, was in God's plan. So he was presumptuous. It's like when we pray and we tell God what we want him to do. You know, we, we don't just ask him, help me. We tell him, well, here's, if you'll do this and that, and then make me better, and so I can go do this over here and I'll have a better chance to do. If you do all of these things, my life will be so much better, Lord. Well, that's presumptuous, you know. Uh, the, the only prayer we can actually make is, Lord, let your will be done in my life and help me accept that will. That's the prayer that we make. And then the third one, I was looking for another P, but I couldn't find a good word, so I just settled for good old fashioned. He was pig-headed. 
he was pig-headed, five to 11. He refused to acknowledge that God was the God of everyone. He didn't see that the same God who offered him refuge with the plant also offered salvation to an entire city. You know, when he talks about so many hundreds of thousands of people that don't know their right hand from their left, he's talking about children. He's talking about children, children who don't know the right from the left. They, they, they haven't reached the age of reason. Uh, so, so God is appealing to Jonah uh, you know, to have a sense of mercy. It's not that there were only 120,000 people in the city. There's 120,000 children in the city, not to mention the parents of those children, the grandparents and so on and so forth. So it's a large city. And then he talks about the animals and so on and so forth. So to destroy the whole city would be, uh, would be a terrible loss of uh, life. Jonah, of course, uh, refused to believe his own preaching that God spared those who repented and called on him for forgiveness. He accepted that for himself, but he wouldn't extend it to his enemies. In the end, his faults canceled out his gifts, rendering him unable to share in the rewards of his preaching. He should have been happy. He should have been happy. The Lord used me to preach to a nation who responded to that preaching and were saved. Lives were saved. Unnecessary destruction was avoided. He, he should have seen this as a victory, but he didn't. He saw it as a defeat. I think that's why the story ends abruptly. There's no closure. A lot of people read the, you know, the last chapter of Jonah and they go, well, is that it? You know, it just stops. All of a sudden, boom, it stops. You don't know if he goes back home. You, you know, what happens? Well, there's no closure in the story because there's no closure uh, in, in Jonah. The story uh, ends in that way because it reflects where Jonah was in his spirit. He had no closure about this thing. And we don't, you know, people say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about this and that. You know, uh, when I get to heaven, I'd like to ask God, whatever happened to Jonah? You know, whatever happened to that guy? What happened after this? We, we, we just don't know. All right, well, we're going to stop here. We've read the story and we're going to continue next time with lessons that the people of Jonah's era could draw for themselves from his story, as well as modern day lessons that we uh, can use today based on Jonah's experience that took place uh, you know, 2,500 years ago. So we'll stop right here and we'll pick this up in our next lesson. Thank you for your attention.